Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History, and welcome to this week's History is Lunch program, which is sponsored by the John and Lucy Shackelford Charitable Fund of the Community Foundation for Mississippi. We're in our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium of the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum, and if you've not already done so, please silence your cell phones. Join us next week for History's Lunch when Alfred Teen Harrison will discuss the history of midwives in Mississippi. It's been a an ongoing project of hers, and we're delighted to have her scheduled for next week. Today, we're delighted to welcome remotely Keisha Blaine, author of the new book, Until I Am Free, Fannie Lou Hamer's Enduring Message to America. Keisha N. Blaine, a 2022 National Fellow at New America, is Associate Professor of History at the University of Pittsburgh, President of the Ameri African American Intellectual History Society, and a columnist for MSNBC. She is currently in residence at the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at Harvard University and a member of the School of Social Science at the Institute for Advanced Study. Blaine earned her BA in History and Africana Studies from Binghamton University and her MA and PhD in History from Princeton University. She is co-editor with Ibram X. Kendi of the number one New York Times bestseller, 400 Souls, A Community History of African America, 1619 to 2019. Blaine is the author of Set the World on Fire, Black Nationalist Women and the Global Struggle for Freedom, and co-editor of To Turn the Whole World Over, Black Women and Internationalism, New Perspectives on the Black Intellectual Tradition, and Charleston Syllabus, Readings on Race, Racism, and Racial Violence. We are fortunate to have with us on site two of the people who knew Mrs. Hamer best, her youngest daughter, Jacqueline Hamer Flakes, and Charles McLaurin, who met Mrs. Hamer in 1962 when he was sent to the Delta with SNCC. He served as her campaign manager in her 1964 congressional run and worked with Hamer around political and economic issues through the 1970s. Help me welcome Dr. Keisha Blaine, Jackie Hamer Flakes, and Charles McLaurin. Dr. Blaine, if you can hear us, you are good to go. Thank you for being with us today. Looks like Dr. Blaine's video has seized up on us. Give us just a moment, and we'll get that worked out. Many of y'all will know Elbert Hilliard, the longtime director of archives and history, who had a great line along the, to the, something to the point of, ah, oh, technology is wonderful <laughs> when it works. <laughs> right. We're going to make this work. Give us just a moment. While we wait on Dr. Blaine to manage the technical issues on her end, why don't we go ahead and hear a few words from Mr. McLaurin about his long friendship, relationship with Ms. Hamer. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, go way back about 60 years ago, a guy by a SNCC organizer by the name of Bob Moses uh, took me to the Mississippi Delta from here in Jackson. I was born here in Jackson, went to Linear High School, went to uh, um, uh, Mary C. Joan Elementary School, went to Smith Robinson, it's now the museum. Uh, I grew up here in Jackson, up and down Ferris Street. 
in the old days. And uh, Freedom Riders came, and I got hooked up with them. And then uh, Medgar Evers and Bob Moses took me to the Delta. So, and took me to Ruleville, Mississippi. And uh, <laughs> Bob took us up there, dropped us off in a cotton field, and said, sink or swim. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. McLaughlin, That's since we I have think. Dr. Blaine back, maybe we'll see. Can you hear us, Dr. Blaine? Yes, yes. Sorry for those Hopefully technical difficulties. Yes, indeed. Well, we'll let you go ahead then, and we'll hear from Mr. McLaurin when you finish. Sounds good. Well, thank you so much to everyone. Thank you for being here. I know there's so much going on in the world, and you could have chosen to be anywhere else. So it means a lot to me that you chose to, to join us. Uh, this morning into this afternoon. I am absolutely honored uh, to be here to talk about Fannie Lou Hamer. Uh, this book, Until I Am Free, Fannie Lou Hamer's Enduring Message to America, is a book that I felt I truly needed to write at this particular moment. Uh, as I explained uh, in the introduction of the book, I first learned about Fannie Lou Hamer as a senior in college, and um, this was 2008. I was taking a, a course on the civil rights movement, uh, and I had already declared a major in history and Africana studies. So I, I was taking all of these courses on, on the black experience in the US and, and also in the global context. And I was truly captivated um, by Mrs. Hamer. Uh, in fact, uh, I think that it's that particular encounter that helped me even figure out my own path forward. I think anyone who heard uh, Mrs. Hamer speak know what I'm talking about. You know, if you hear her, her speech at the Democratic National Convention uh, in August 1962, uh, it, it's hard not to, not to have chills. I mean, it's hard not to be moved to tears um, because she spoke so passionately, so powerfully. Uh, she's someone who, as I explained uh, in the book, really encapsulates this idea of radical honesty. She would truly tell you the truth. I mean, she would tell you like it, like it is, and which of course uh, is something she said often. Um, and she didn't mince words. Uh, she didn't worry about your, your comfort level. As she saw a problem, she called it out. Uh, and, and her goal was to make sure that you um, didn't leave her, her presence um, the same way you came in. Uh, th there was a way that once you had an encounter with Mrs. Hamer, you would be transformed. Uh, and, and I think that'll be clear even as we're talking today uh, with, with those who knew her uh, best uh, and you know, can, can attest uh, that she had the power, I think, uh, to, to really um, impact people in such a positive way. Uh, and, and so I have been thinking about uh, Mrs. Hamer uh, over the years. Uh, and one of the reasons why I wrote this book was because I thought it was necessary in this particular moment, in the context of everything that we've been going through uh, on a national level, uh, of course, the uprisings of um, last spring and last summer, but even more so uh, uh, an, an array of challenges, including um, the pandemic, which we're still dealing with, um, you know, as well as uh, some of the challenges that, that I think unfolded under the Trump presidency. And I, and I think uh, many people would say to me, how do you have hope? How do you manage to keep going? Um, and, and I would say to them, one of the reasons that I have hope uh, is because of, of folks like Mrs. Hamer. When I go back to her speeches, when I read her words, I am so um, encouraged that they really do provide the fuel that I need to keep going. Uh, and more importantly, I felt that it was important that, that, that so many people look to Mrs. Hamer that they take seriously her political ideas, that they take seriously um, you know, her words, her, her vision, her message for this country, her message for, for the world. And so this book was meant to, I think, to certainly introduce people to, to Mrs. Hamer for those who did not know um, her, but, but even those who know a little bit about her to, to take them a bit deeper uh, and, and more to get us to the place where we can uh, begin to draw from Hamer's words and experiences uh, in order to come up with strategies uh, for tackling an array of problems, including problems that Hamer um, dealt with uh, in, in her lifetime. And of course, I'm talking about the, the ongoing struggle uh, for voting rights. And, and now we know uh, that the Voting Rights Act uh, is under attack as it has been uh, for, for many years. 
And so once again, we're, we're, we're having to talk about voter suppression. We're talking about state sanctioned violence. Um, we're talking about economic inequality. And so uh, in a nutshell, what my hope, is, my hope for this book is that people will read the book, would be inspired uh, and would see how Hamer has left uh, just a, a lasting mark on all of us. Uh, and, and I absolutely think that we should be talking about Fannie Lou Hamer uh, with the same uh, rigor and passion that we talk about uh, so many other civil rights activists who, are, who tend to be uh, more well known, uh, you know, such as Martin Luther King Jr., um, you know, such as uh, John Lewis, all important individuals, uh, not to diminish them, but to simply say that Fannie Lou Hamer too uh, deserves um, um, a spot. Uh, she absolutely did the work and, and uh, transformed this nation and certainly transformed this world. So uh, thank you all for being here. I'm excited to have this conversation. Well, thank you, Doc. And uh, again, uh, my hat's off to you. Um, I started to read the book, got about halfway, uh, but the introduction, uh, uh, you really gave the information in the introduction. Uh, and then I read the uh, last few pages uh, in the book. And um, you made it so clear that Fannie Lou Hamer's message, uh, I was with her uh, from her very inception into the movement, and she amazed me all the time. And uh, I was always uh, wondering how and why she uh, did some things that she did. I recall the first time I ever met her. Now, I was on the bus that brought her to Indianola to register to vote, along with other SNCC people. But I didn't know her at that time. But then, uh, after she was uh, let go from the plantation, and she come into Ruville to, to live, and then the, the, uh, the, the meeting where Foreman and others informed her of her right to vote, um, and then I was assigned to bring her to Tougaloo College. And from Tougaloo College, we took her, this is in 1963, to Nashville, Tennessee, to Fitz University in Nashville to a SNCC meeting. And she, at that SNCC meeting, the SNCC leadership and all of the SNCC people and others there saw in her what Ella Baker had taught them. Here was this person who could articulate. Uh, she used the Bible because that the Bible was her book. I mean, you know, her whole uh, teaching, her family, her mother, uh, and her father taught her from the Bible. And uh, so, but when I went up, th went to pick her up that day. Uh, I didn't know who I was going to pick up except they told me Fannie Lou Hamer. And I had heard the name of Fannie Lou Hamer on that bus, but I didn't know her. And uh, when I knocked on the door to the little the shanty shack where I would find her, and I said, and she, and a voice inside said, come in. So I walk in, and in front of me is a wing back chair. And in and then uh, somebody in the chair, the, 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 her head was not over the back of, the, of this wing back. And so, and then there was a, uh, a heater in front of the, uh, where she was sitting. And, um, and I, when I walked in, uh, I said, I'm looking for Fannie Lou Hamer. And this little lady stood up, faced me, and said, I'm Fannie Lou Hamer. This is my first meeting, actually meeting with her. And I said, uh, I'm supposed to pick you up and bring you to Tougaloo College. She said, have a, have a seat, I'll be right with you. Now, she didn't know me and I didn't really know her. She was always ready to go. Fannie Lou Hamer had this moving spirit and she was not one to sit around doing nothing. <laughs> Rim noticed she'd be sitting out in front of her house, running for Congress, sitting out in front of her house with a, with a bucket of peas, shelling peas, <laughs> you know. But uh, so uh, 
but she was always amazed. She, 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 she really made me f feel good, even when I was afraid. You know, uh, you know, I mean, it was dangerous back in 1961, uh, 62, to talk about going to the courthouse. You're taking people up to the courthouse, and sometimes there's a little group of people waiting around there to, do, <laughs> to run you away. But she just, the, the, the lady was, you know, uh, one other time, I don't, don't want to monopolize all the time. Now, you shut me up. <laughs> uh, when I remember when I got a call one day to, to go and, and uh, pick up Fannie Lou Hamer and take her and, to get her qualified to run for Congress. See, I, the, when they said that to me, you know, something inside me questioned why they're doing this. I mean, what, <laughs> you know, I. Uh, had seen now congressmen at that time were all white, and there certainly was uh, here is this here, here come a sharecropper, you know, who is not a doctor, who is not a lawyer, who is not a business person, and I said, uh, how do you do that? How do you how do you get a person qualified to run for Congress? And uh, they said you find out. Go get Fannie Lou Hamer and take her to get her qualified to run for Congress. Now this is my snake boss is telling me that. So I go to Mrs. Hamer's house. I usually go there almost every day to find out if she had things that she wanted me to do and so forth. So. This morning I come in, I said, Ms. Hamer, I came to pick you up to take you to get qualified to run for Congress. She says, Mac, have a seat. I'll be right with you. And this shocked me, <laughs> you know, because I expected her to say, Mac, oh, get away from here. Look, man, I, I don't know nothing about running for Congress, you know. I, so... <laughs> Uh, to uh, make a long story short, we uh, after we got, I found out that you had to go to come here to the Secretary of State's office, and that you had to uh, uh, sign some papers and everything. So Fannie Lou and I went into the Secretary of State's office, and we and, and I told the lady that uh, we we want to qualify to run for Congress. Of course, it was all white ladies there at that time, and it shocked them. Because I heard her go back there and what she said, what she called us. And then I looked around and there was about ten white ladies all peeping out there at us. And uh, so she finally come back and handed us a stack of papers. And uh, Fannie Lou and I take the papers and go out into the corridor of the Secretary of State in the building. And we fill out the papers to the best of our ability. And then uh, when we go back with the papers, then the lady says... Uh, you need a check for five hundred dollars if you're going to if, if you're going to be run as a party candidate, and uh, and you have that check uh, cashier's check has to be made out to secretary of the of whichever party that you're going to run, and so we go out into the corridor and call, we didn't have these cell phones then there was a phone uh, booth down the hall there and I went down called the office the COFO office and they. Um, and told them, they said, don't go no place. The check, the $500 check will be there. Just You all just hang loose. A guy comes, bring the check. We take the check back into the uh, uh, office. And um, she said, good. You got one thing else to do. And she said, at the time the candidate qualifies for office, he or she has to name their campaign manager and the campaign manager has to sign a form. And, and this is the last day to qualify. The office closes officially at 5. But we want these, this information all in by 4.30. So Fannie Lou and I go out into the corridor. Again, we go, I go and call the COFO office and tell them. And well, I didn't tell them nothing because nobody answers the phone now. See, uh, 
kept calling, kept calling. Then about 4.15, the white lady come out and she said, hey, y'all, who, who's going to be the campaign manager? And so Mrs. Hayman and I go back out into the corridor. I'm walking up and down the corridor. She's over there just sitting around and, and you know, thinking. And, and finally, she got up and came over there to me and she said, Mac, so go in there and put your name on them papers and let's go home. <laughs> I said, Miss Amos, I don't know a thing in the world about being no campaign manager. And she said, Mac, you know as much about being a campaign manager as I know about running for Congress. Put your name on the papers and let's go home. <laughs> so I wound up, you know, being a campaign manager. And I think we did a pretty good job for the fact we wasn't going to win anyway because this was a part of a strategy to... Uh, get some uh, lawsuits filed uh, because the district had been gerrymandered. William, you know how they had, uh, the legislature had uh, uh, cut across the Delta diagonally and put the Delta, the, our solid Delta district into three or four other, two or three other districts. I think we had about five congressmen at that time. But see, how she, Dr. Bland, you see how this, what she does? I mean, she, she didn't consider what I had considered, considered at first. I considered her not to be the person to run for Congress. I, I, I didn't even consider myself to be, to run for Congress. And I had had a little taste of college, <laughs> you know. So, but she was courageous, brave, she was determined. And, and as you mentioned in the book, if she set her mind on this, this is going to happen. She didn't believe in compromise. I know her, I was around when she would get into it with some of our fr uh, political friends uh, who, uh, uh, you know, she just, she fell out with one of them. And I'm not going to mention the name here. He, big, uh, I love that guy. And he's, uh, he's one of my mentors. Uh, but uh, she didn't believe in compromise, and uh, she believed that uh, things ought to go a certain way, and that's the way she wanted those. She stuck to that. I don't ever remember her changing from uh, anything. She was always moving forward. Fannie Lou Hamer uh, thought that once you got involved in something and it was something that's important, you don't let it drop, you know. Uh, the struggle to her ongoing, uh, the struggle don't end. Uh, for instance, the civil rights movement get to a point and, uh, and then there's you, everything's in limbo kind of. Uh, Fannie Lou Hamer wasn't stopping because Dr. King stopped or because the movement didn't seem to be moving. She was moving all the time and uh, doing things that uh, later the national civil rights movement could attach to. The movement in Mississippi actually made the civil rights movement national civil rights movement. You have to, I, I understand Montgomery, and I understand Emmett Till, and I understand the various kinds of things that took place, but when you look at how Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party came about, you look at how uh, Freedom Summer came about. You look at what those things did. Fannie Lou Hamer was pushing those. There were those of us who were really against the Freedom Summer project. Fannie Lou Hamer said, we are going to do it. And, uh, and of course, she and Bob Moses uh, had, you know, support that. Uh, but uh, the lady amazed me all the time. I mean, and, and, and one of the, and I'd like, let me say this and then <laughs> I, I told you, stop me. Uh, but because uh, I like talking about her, see, Doc, see, uh, when I every time I see something about her or read something in the newspaper, I got up that article. I cut that out, and every book I've got, I don't know, thirty, forty books of uh, uh, that I bought uh, recently uh, and over the, the period because it was about Fannie Lou Hamer. See, I saw the significance of what she did. I was in the credentials room when she spoke, you know. Uh, I was in the car when we left Tulu College. Uh, I, I'm 22 years old. She's 44 years old. Uh, there's Dory Ladner in that car, Charlie Cobbs in that car, James Jones in that car. All of us 
un, 20, and maybe I think I might have been the oldest person in the car. And, but um, she's right in the middle there. <laughs> I mean, and, you know, we never saw her other than Mrs. Hamer, and, and, and she was our inspiration. She, she brought something up out of us that we didn't know was in our, ourselves. Again, when we went to run for Congress, she, she, she made me a campaign manager. <laughs> and, and, and against my will, but uh, it, there's a lesson in that for me and others that she just made us feel and to uh, just bring up what's in you. I mean, she, so, hey, a Cookie, I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't start me. <laughs> Um, just thinking back as to what he was saying about um, Mama Fanny just not accepting anything other than the 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 best out of everybody. Um, just imagine being at the church and you were probably there with her since you were with her all the time. Um, when somebody tried to downplay her um, when she got up and spoke and yeah. it was somebody who had a Ph.D., and what did she say? Your PhD could mean post hole digger. Yeah. So <clears throat> yeah. this is this is the attitude that she had. You know, you're not gonna downplay anything. I mean, if she could speak in front of congressmen, in front of presidents, in front of um kings and queens, I mean, um just and loving people, just people coming home from her um, traveling and being able to just sit in our den and just talk to people and everybody's just focused on her because, I mean, when she would get up, I mean, if she put that hand on that hip and rear back, oh, you know what was coming. <laughs> you know what was coming. So, um I mean, I I was really young. I mean, just imagine um, my biological mother was Dorothy Jean. That was the first baby that she got. And um, then she got Virgie. So just imagine having to take care of her blind mother, um, taking care of her husband, going out on the plantation, doing what she had to do, and then taking care of these babies, you know, babies that weren't hers. Let me let me go back, and I don't want to cry, but think about that opportunity being taken from her. <sighs> the opportunity was taken from her, and she had no knowledge that it was being done. So she raised these beautiful babies. My biological mom died when she was 22 years old. And my dad was getting ready to go to the military. And his family was going to take my sister, Lenora. She was 19 months old. I was only 8 months old. They, um, they were going to split us up because I was sick all the time. So Mama Fanny was like, oh, no, Fess, we can't do that. My baby wouldn't want her children split up like that. Why don't you just allow me to take them? So I guess he went and talked to his family. He came back and he allowed Mama Fanny and Daddy Pat. I'm calling them that, but it was really Mama and Papa. That's what we called them. But um, I'm saying it like this today. Um, and they agreed. And she just imagined this is four daughters. Four beautiful daughters that she raised and brought up as her own. She adopted me and my sister. And um, we're her daughters, not her granddaughters, her daughters. And that's what I love about her. I mean, when she passed away, I was nine going on ten. But just think about um, going to sessions where there was a conference in Georgia where I met the King family, and there was somebody who always watched me and my sister um, while she was inside of the conference, but I stood outside that door one day, and 
I heard her talking about um, what had happened um, when she tried to register to vote. And I really didn't know what she was talking about, but I mean, just the sense of urgency in her voice when she was explaining everything that had happened. And I just think today that there are so many things that are going on that are basically the same as it was back then. Just thinking about the city of Ruval. And I mean, um, the things that she fought for back then, you have to really, I, I see people getting paid to do it these days. When back in the day growing up, watching her, they would load the truck up, load the station wagon up, taking people to go vote, taking people to go register. I mean, just out when, for instance, there was a family who lived in Ruval, and a little girl sitting around being nosy again, but a lady brought in her daughter, little girl. She had gone to the corner store, and that was Milam's store. And I don't know if you all know, but Mr. Milam was related to um, the family that killed em Emmett Till. Right. And also, um, they were related to the um, deputy sheriff who um, had the inmates to beat Mama and her peers. And um, just thinking about that lady bringing her daughter in and the little girl... Um, her mother said, now tell, tell Miss Stanley what, what happened. And the little girl was explaining that she went in the store to buy something and she was getting ready to leave and the man kicked her in her behind. And um, what I'm understanding then was it wasn't a slight kick, but for anybody to raise their foot up and put it on a human being, period, is unacceptable. So... They boycott it. But, you know, the thing is, when you do something like that, you expect or you would hope that the people around you in your town, your color, your race, your peers, your family, you expect that they would be behind you. But the next day, they were there in the store purchasing items like nothing had ever happened. So, I mean, my thing is, what lesson did they learn from that? Was there a lesson learned? And just thinking about Head Start, my sister and I were one of the um, first groups of kids who attended Head Start in Ruval. And um, I was four years old when they asked me to sing at one of the graduations. And... Um, we always had Mama singing in the house when she was at home. So one thing I loved to do back then was sing. I still love to sing, but I have um, issues with my larynx and spa um, spasm, muscle spasms start um, acting up. But I just want to, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it go. <clears throat> This little light, light of mine, I'm gonna let it, let it shine. This little light of mine, oh, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. I think about, like you said, the bucket of peas. <laughs> Basket. <laughs> oh. I got so sick of butter beans and peas and okra and tomatoes and, and killing hogs and, oh, my goodness. We always had food, always. We had the garden. We had Freedom Farm where people could come and bring their families and, you know, just get what you need to sustain. Get what you need to take you through. They had the piglets. Families get the pigs. You raise your pig. Let it mate. After you get the piglets, 
you bring one back so that other families could keep on, so keep on. We had truckloads of clothing that would come in. We would see the 18-wheelers pull up and back into the yard. Now, we had a four-car garage. Mr. J.D. Story built our home. But it, w it was a house that Mama had purchased, a little small house. I remember. That he moved to that section of land. It was two plots that they purchased. They moved that little house there, and he built around it. So this four-car garage never had a car parked in it. And I'm like, why do we have a garage? And, and my sister was like, shut up, girl. Don't be asking mom and papa that. But then growing up, I realized, oh, my goodness, mason jars in the, by the case just stacked up from her preserves. I mean... Pickles, peaches, pears, strawberries, muscadines. I mean, we would have the chitlin kill. In, in the wintertime, they would, each, whatever family was going to kill hogs, they would let everybody know, and you go out there and you would help them. And at the end of the day, you got dinner because they would take the hog malls and, and the chitlins, and they would, they would clean those. Lord, I hated those big number eight tubs. <laughs> they, would, they, would, they would have that in the den, and they would have the water holes and have it running and, and cleaning the chitlins and the hog malls, and it smelled so bad. But I'd go outside, and they'd have the, the pork, and they'd cut the, cut the uh, uh, middling up, and then they'd be cooking out the cracklings, and from that you'd have the lard. So I'm like, why do we not go to the grocery store? <laughs> All we go to the grocery store get is flour and meal and sugar and salt and pepper. We had everything. We had everything. So getting back to the hog killing. We had a big deep freezer, but first of all, we had to take the hams and salt those down and hang them up. And, they, and then after a while, you would take them down, and that would be your ham or your bacon or whatever. And I remember one time, now, I didn't think we believed in superstition, but um, you know how they say, don't, don't let the black cat cross in front of you? But we had a black cat living in our home. Her name was Meow. We had the hog killing, and they had just hung the hams up. And there was this young lady who came to the house, and Mama kept looking at her, and she was like, baby, is you pregnant? And the young lady was like, yes, ma'am. Mama was like, you got to go. You got to go because you're going to spoil our meat. You got to go. <laughs> <laughs> She wasn't spoiling at me. She had to go. <laughs> now, now, she went outside and talked to her, but she wasn't going to talk inside. We had to have that meat. <laughs> Goodness. Now, she um, made sure that my sister and I were involved in, in church. We um, went to church um, every Sunday, Sunday school, whatever. If Mama wasn't in town, then... Um, we had um, Mr. Conley. Mr. Conley was an old man driving, and he'd be like this because he was basically blind, but no one could stop him from driving. They'd take the keys. He'd find them. We'd either go get another set made. He'd tell a man at the store, keep me a key here. They'd try and stop me from driving. So Mr. Conley would come and pick us up and make sure we made it to Sunday school or church service, whatever. We had Aunt Lara down the street. That was Mama's sister. And they were really close. And uh, Aunt Lara used to love making the pies and the cakes. Now, Mama wasn't, wasn't too keen on the sweets, making them, but her savory dishes. Oh, my goodness. Um, talk about a meatball about this big. I remember her... Uh, making a trip to Africa, 
and um, Miss Julie Belafonte was with her on this trip and Miss Julie talks about this now and they laugh and she talks about how the president came to the hotel and he wanted to meet mama and Miss Julie ran up there to the room and she was like Fanny the president's down there he wanted me she said uh uh I got hair rattles in my hair <laughs> so Miss Julie was like well he can't come back you got to get them rollers out your hair we got to get you made up so mm -hmm. we can go on down so they hurried up and went downstairs, and she met the president. And when she came back, she came back with a group of people from Africa. And I remember them just making the most delicious meals that I, that I I'll say I've never tasted. And I've never tasted it ever again. But to j just, just a short thing... She loved people. She got along with everybody, you know. It didn't matter if you were from Ruval, from Africa, from California. Mr. Harry Belafonte, that was, um, she was his mentor. And when I say a tight family, she loved him and they loved her. And when she went to New York, that's where she stayed, at their home. And uh, Miss Blaine, just to get back to your book, I read some stuff that I didn't even know. And I appreciate you. I thank you so much for bringing it to life. And I mean, unlike Ms. Mr. Um, McLaurin, I started reading it and I didn't want to put it down, but I knew I had to go to sleep to go to work the next morning. So then the next day I tried to read some more and I'm like, we got a board meeting. I got to get back up to the city hall. But I was like, well, I can put my book in, uh, in my purse and just in case they have to go into, you know, uh, executive session, I can run and get the book and I can read some more. But I appreciate you. Thank you so much. And I appreciate you all for being here. I mean, normally I'm not a talker like this, but just talking about mama and just sharing, you know, the experiences that I had being around her. And I mean, it's just I get chills when I when I talk about her and think about, you know, the experience of just thinking about her giving of her time to take in my mom, Virgie, then my sister and myself. That's nothing but love. I'm done. <laughs> I want to. I want to uh, pick up a couple things there. Uh, when she talked about uh, Mrs. Hamer uh, not having children, she had gone to the hospital and unknowingly uh, the hospital, uh, the doctor gave her a hysterectomy. And uh, she finds out about this later, but it was not just happening with her at that time. You know, there was a, <laughs> there was a conspiracy to keep, to cut the population, cut the black population. So uh, that was that reason. And then, and then uh, Jackie mentioned uh, Africa. Oh man, this, Mrs. Hamer was so elated about that trip. Uh, she, she and I were on our way to, I used to go and pick her up at the airport when she would come in uh, from speaking engagements in Memphis. And so that's about a hundred and some miles from uh, uh, from Ruville, and she'd talk all the way from the airport to Ruville. I, I'm just driving. And she, that trip to Africa elevated Mrs. Hamer uh, way out of sight. She talked about meeting uh, Halle Salasis, uh, and then she saw, uh, talked about uh, African Americans who were uh, pilots, you know, and, 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 uh, and uh, black people running a government, you know. You have Working to in the bank. Yeah. <laughs> and she had to, you know, uh, so this, this brought her to, uh, not to this 
world, international uh, understanding more about uh, the little things she talked about, about registering and voting. Uh, okay, you're getting people registered to vote. Uh, who they're going to vote for, what they're going to vote for, um, wh why are they going to vote? These were questions, you know, and it, and it was something that us SNCC people had to come to grip with because we wasn't thinking about it. We were thinking about uh, getting people registered to vote. Now, we had not thought about what, what Medgar said, and I, Medgar was one of my mentors. Medgar said that we would put good white folks in office. He put black people and good white folks. So I just took that for granted. And so we registered them and, and we were going to turn them loose out there and, and let the good white folks or the, the black folks, you know, get them to vote. But then as we moved along, Mrs. Hamer and I were talking about it and uh, we, she ran for Congress uh, for, for educational purposes. See, African Americans hadn't really voted in this state and in the Deep South since 1890, in the, in the 1890s when they took away our uh, right to vote. And uh, so certainly 50 years later, people on the plantation like Ms. Hamer didn't even, I mean, they didn't even think about voting. That was white folks' business. But now Fannie Lou is beginning to see and, 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 and get involved in this. So the educational process here is, 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 is taking shape. And she, when we're driving along, with, she said, Mac, we got to get these people organized to, uh, uh, to run for office. We got to get them uh, prepared for that. So that congressional run was a building toward that. Then she and I both ran for seats in the state senate, and uh, we didn't have a possible chance of winning, uh, you know. But the idea was, and she'd tell me, because I'd ask her, I said, "Miss Hamer, why are we, you know?" Uh, she said, "Mac, we got to keep the movement going." She said, "This, this, um, um, you know, the movement don't stop, the struggle don't stop." Now. In, in 1962, we were trying to register voters. We got people registered. We got the Voting Rights Act. And then, what? There's somebody coming to take it away from us. We, so, what Fannie Lou Hamer said was that once the movement started, this struggle, it's continuous. The, the, the struggle don't stop because some people get tired and drop out or they get, uh, you know, a good job and drop out because there's always the need for a movement. There won't ever be, she said, Mac, there won't ever be a time for the movement to stop because somebody is always going to be trying to take something away from it. She, she could politically, you know, she, she had this, she just amazed me, I'm telling you. If I had spent that, them, them, the two years, three years that I spent in the movement in college, I wouldn't have never learned as much as I learned uh, from Fannie Lou Hamer and the movement. Uh, Doc, the, um, you mentioned the book, uh, um, No One is Free Until I'm Free. You know, um, forward movement, Ms. Hamer used to say uh, that if they shot me down, I'm not going to fall back. I'm not going to go back. I'm going to fight. She was five feet, was it four, I think? Forward. I'm going to fall five feet, four forward. And, 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 and that there was no going back. So um, the, your book is, uh, look, I, there's a, a a a piece in there I think where you mentioned about your um, um, about when you're doing this research how this research uh, elevated you uh, your student at I think at that time I don't know whether you uh, were mm -hmm. uh, already a doctor and uh, but uh, you saw something in her 
that the SNCC people saw when I took her to that first SNCC conference. See, when that conference was over, Fannie Lou Hamer would, would, had been swept up by the SNCC movement. John Lewis and Jim, Bob Mose and all. They, they took her on a whirlwind tour of colleges and universities around the country, and she didn't get back to Ruleville. She, we went to that conference, I think, in October, and uh, she didn't get back until near Christmas. And, uh, but she had been traveling and meeting all these people, and uh, everybody was uh, Dr. Heights uh, and uh, Shirley Chisholm and all of these the women mm -hmm. liberation, liberators. Um, she, uh, she was with these people all the time, helped create the Women's Caucus. I mean, she, um, mm -hmm. she had exposure to people who had learning, and then they learned from her, you know. So, uh, and and uh, you mentioned about the the uh, food, uh, the uh, the white power structure in the Delta cut off uh, food surplus to um, uh, the sharecroppers, and mm -hmm. that Mrs. Hamer started a food distribution. Uh, a project and people sent it in, and and she set up. Uh, uh, we created our own registration form and had people to register with us to build the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. And when the and when that when when those um, people would come, she'd have them to fill out the card and had a bus over there waiting to take them right to the courthouse and in order to register to vote. So. Uh, Doc, I can't say enough about her. <laughs> she was one of my inspirations and still today. Thank you all. Uh, there are a few minutes left. I know we will have questions and comments from the audience. We have lots of questions and comments from the live stream. And while y'all are getting your questions together, I'm going to read a few of these. Pat Vale says, I was a COFO volunteer in 1964-65 and sang often with Ms. Samer during our community meetings and even on the boardwalk in Atlantic City. Um, she has always been one of my heroes. And uh, Dee Dee Baldwin at Mississippi State University asks, if any of the participants have seen Sharon Miles' one woman show about Fannie Lou Hamer? No. I, can't, I don't no, recall. She does that uh, at New Stage and, and other places. It's really great. And then I'll read one more and we'll get to some in-room questions, but uh, I don't want to miss this. Joyce Ladner says, <laughs> I met Mrs. Hamer in 1962. My sister Dory Ladner was with Mr. McLaurin when Mrs. Hamer and others rode the bus to attempt to register to vote. Mrs. Hamer was a moral leader and not a politician. That is why she didn't believe in compromise. Her reaction to the Democratic Party's offer of two seats was typical of her servant leader role when she quipped, we didn't come here for no two, two seats. seats. And all of us is tired. <laughs> Surely there are questions. There's a question and there's a question. Dr. Blaine, thank you for contributing to the research on Mrs. Hamer, her courage and integrity. What does the book bring out? Is it one event in her life, or does it cover all of her activism? Thank you for that question. Uh, so the book is a blend of biography, uh, intellectual history, and, and social commentary. And, and what I've done is I've arranged the book thematically to, to grapple with what I see as some of the most important uh, themes and, and some of the most important um, concerns that, that, that Hamer engaged in her lifetime. Uh, and so uh, I grapple with uh, certainly her involvement uh, in the women's movement. I talk about her involvement in the National Women's Political Council. So I talk about the theme of women's empowerment. I talk about uh, internationalism. I talk about her, her global racial consciousness, her, her ideas um, concerning Vietnam. Um, I, I talk about um, state sanctioned violence. I talk about voter suppression. And so pretty much what I do is, is focus on 
several uh, very important themes, uh, including economic uh, injustice, which of course we've been talking about in, in her work around Freedom Farm, uh, in order to uh, once again pull out um, her political ideas and strategies uh, and, 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 and to force us to think about how we might draw upon those uh, to address those concerns uh, in the modern context. This question is for Mr. McLaurin. I was hoping you could share with the audience your personal story about how you got involved in the movement. Um, I know I've heard it before, but I just thought the audience might be interested. Well, quickly, I, uh, as I said, I grew up here in Jackson, went to Lanier High School, and uh, the Freedom Riders, I, my, really my early inspiration uh, came from uh, the Freedom Riders coming here to Jackson, and uh, along with other of my friends. Uh, and uh, one night, uh, James de Bevel, who was uh, working for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference with Dr. King's organization, came to our community pool hall up the, here in Jackson. This is after the Freedom Riders were in, in jail. There are a bunch of them in jail already, and uh, he's trying to recruit uh, people uh, from Jackson to continue the Freedom Ride. If you recall, the Freedom Ride, was, the destination was New Orleans, and, uh, but they, when they got here to Jackson, they never got there because they put them all in jail as fast as they came. So what Belva wanted to do was get some people in Jackson involved to to try to buy a ticket on the white and black sides of the, the to continue the freedom ride to uh, to New Orleans, and so one night Bevel came and and challenged us, uh, and he said uh, that oh, y'all you bad guys. I said, but I don't think there's anybody in here bad enough to to go buy a ticket to uh, go on the white side of the the. Uh, bus station to buy a ticket to New Orleans and he said I'm paying I'm buying the tickets and uh, you, you know so um, when I left that night none of my, nobody there took him up on it but but somewhere over the, the night I wake up the next morning nine of my friends are in jail because that night they tried to buy a ticket to New Orleans and so um, then they are locked up, then they get out. Jesse Harris was one of them. He was also one of my friends from here in Jackson. He and I went to high school together and started to college together. But um, the what happened was that I decided that I needed, I wanted to do something, but I didn't want to go to jail. And uh, so, uh, <laughs> so what I did was I decided to go to the state fair. The state fair was segregated, right? This fairground right down here, it was segregated. And so I thought that would be, I, certainly they are saying the fair is open to everybody, what they're saying, y'all come, this is a state fair. So I went down there and found out it wasn't. They ran me away from the, from the fairground. They had the police and the dogs to run me away. And, uh, and, I, and it, it, it angered me, uh, you know, that... that <laughs> So I went back after they ran me off. I went back and I got arrested. And I'm in jail, stayed in jail all night. I'm, I'm in the place I didn't want to go, really didn't want to go to jail. I couldn't see how going to jail was going to help, um, you know, uh, free us. Because they're getting in jail, they're having to post money, they, they get out, they leave, go home. And I couldn't see how that was going to bring about, uh, uh, you know, uh, freedom. Uh, and but, and I, so, Meg Evers came and got me out of jail. Uh, after I'd been there, and the next morning he came and posted my bond. I had seen Meg, but I had never met him. You know, never. I he used to. He lived out where I lived, out in Georgetown, and he would drive through every day, going to his office out there at Lynch Street. Black folks knew him, but they were really kind of hesitant. You know, Medgar was kind of out there by himself, and uh, that's why they thought if they killed him, it would kill the movement, but they waited a little too late. Um, the, um, so Medgar had called a meeting 
of these Mississippi guys who had been in the uh, free, had tried to get the tickets, to, you know, to New Orleans. And I went to the meeting, uh, Jesse Harris and all of them. And uh, Medgar was talking about voter registration. And uh, so what he did, and I asked the question, I said, uh, how are we going to stop Mr. Charlie from lynching us? And um, the white man. And Medgar said, I'm going to show you. Took out this big map of the state of Mississippi. Drew a circle around the Mississippi Delta. And he said, here's where we're going to start. And then he talked about the, how the legislature was apportioned, uh, House and Senate, and how many districts and how many the Delta made up of a certain number of districts. We could send this number of people to the legislature if we get up here and register these voters. And so that's how I got involved. A guy named Lawrence Guiot was working with SNCC. Lawrence Guiot uh, uh, invited me to a meeting at the Freedom House. Uh, and uh, Bob Moses is coming to take any recruits that Guiot had been able to recruit to go uh, up to the Delta to, to open that project. And, and um, so Charlie Cobb, uh, some of you may have read his book. Uh, Charlie had written uh, several books. But Charlie, myself, James Jones, and a guy by the name of um, McNair, Nick McNair and I went to high school together. And so we wound up with Bob up there in the Delta. He took us to Amazon Moore's house. And um, the next day, Amazon Moore took us to Ruleville. And that's how I got up there in the Delta. Uh, uh, but, but, but Medgar had, had, had made me, I felt good about the fact that we were going to be able to take over. <laughs> I, thought, I thought we could go up there and register all the voters in the Delta in about maybe two or three months. <laughs> you know, this is 1962. I saw, I said, oh man, we're going to be able to to put, take people out of office and put people in office. And I thought that could happen within mm -hmm. three, four months. We didn't register a significant number of voters between 1962 and 1967, you know, after the Voting Rights Act. And, uh, and we got our first legislator in Robert Clark in 1967. So, hey, that's, that's where I've been. I've, you know... <laughs> And then when I ran into Fannie Lou Hamer, when I picked her up up there and brought her to Tougaloo College, I fell in love with her then. She talked all the way from, from, from a, a town called Castilla, a hundred and some miles in the Delta up there, to Tougaloo College, and told me the, the, the story of her life. And when she came back from that whirlwind tour, she came right straight back to Ruleville and set up, really, the movement in her front yard. Do you remember we used to sit out there mm -hmm. and uh, write proposals? And, and my wife, oh, stand up, my wife over there. <laughs> stand up. Stand up. My, my wife, my, my wife uh, typed all of Mrs. Hamer's letters. She was not my wife then. She was my girlfriend. But, but we, she wrote the letters. I mean, the same one would sit down and talk to letters. My wife would type them up, and then we'd get them out. And, uh, you know, and she, so she ran the, when we did COFO, then the FDP office, she ran that because there was no money in this. You know, every now and then somebody might come by and hand you $10, and uh, SNCC gave us $10 a month, I mean, a week whenever they had it. But she worked, you know, we kept that movement going, and Mrs. Hamer supported that, the movement locally with the money that she raised. I mean, she'd make $100 doing something, she'd come home, if she had that $100, <laughs> she'd give away 75 of them, you know, to Pope. So, uh, don't, I, my wife told me don't talk too much. You <laughs> Sometimes the hour just flies by. This has been one of those times. Um, 
Dr. Blaine, thank you so much for this book, which is the occasion for this program. We have uh, signed copies of it over here for sale, um, and I am certain that I guess Mr. McLaurin and Ms. Flakes would be glad to sign a copy of it for you as well. Thank you all for being here. Remember, next week we'll have Dr. Alfredine Harrison talking about midwives. We had mentioned Bob Moses' uh, name today. Tomorrow evening at Tougaloo at 6 o'clock, there's a memorial service for Bob Moses. Uh, it's live streaming and also in person, so something for you to bear in mind. Thank you all for being here. And look, let's say, if you don't get, get this book, and I'm telling you, you will see a movement. You'll see, until I'm free, no one is free. That's, you know, the, and, and, and that's true. She, you can't do it by yourself. It's got to be movement ongoing. The book is, 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 is I recommend it, <laughs> if that means anything. <laughs> Help me thank Dr. Keisha Blaine, Charles McLaurin, and Jackie Hamerflakes for this program. Thank you all.